Uh, we are going to the Old Testament. There is value found there. Amen. Second uh, Samuel chapter six in one hand, and First Chronicles fifteen in the other. And I want to talk to you about how to handle your second chance. Let's all stand together for a little bit. Second Samuel chapter six in one hand, and First Chronicles fifteen in the other. You ever uh, ever gone through something and you knew that you blew it? And you said, man, if I ever got a second chance, I would do it differently. You know, some people say that about kids. Some people say that about marriage. Some people say it about a lot of things. Uh, But I'll tell you this. If you know and you're familiar with the God of the Bible, He's a God of second chances. Amen? Amen. And thank God for that. 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we'll start reading in verse number 1. You may or may not be familiar with this story. But this is where David wants to bring the ark of God back. And the ark of God is a picture of the presence of God. God would dwell in between the cherubims. And he would come down, literally, he would come down and meet with his people. All right, And, and so this ark is a very significant item. It's not just another piece of furniture in a church. All right, It is very special. And David wants to bring it back. I want you to look at verse number 1. David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. It's a lot of people to get involved in moving a piece of furniture, amen? I mean, every once in a while, we'll have some work days around here, and I'll be glad of five guys. So 30,000, 30,000 guys to move an ark. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth, look at that, between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. That was in Gibeah. By the way, have you ever read these stories and go, who cares whose house it was in? Why does it matter that it was a... I want to explain why these names matter here in just a little bit. I promise, all right? Uh, And Uzzah and Ahio, not to be confused with Ohio, all right? The sons of Abinadab drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. That means he's in front of it. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came, you know what? They're having a worship service, man. They're having a good time getting ready to bring the ark of God back. And verse 6 says, And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. You know, you would think God would appreciate Uzzah trying to keep the ark on the cart. Look what happens in verse 7. You know, who, you know who you're dealing with? You know who your God is? This is your God if you're saved. It says in verse 7, The anger of the Lord was kindled against us, and God smote him there for his error. And there he... It would say it's a pretty big... Mis- I mean, what an error. Oops! You know? Uh, you know, I, I touched a piece of furniture from church. Oops! And it says here, he took all of it for the oxen, shook it. And the angel of the Lord was kindled against us, and God smote him there for his heir, and there he died by the ark of God. Verse 8 is sort of like a, a dumb moment. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you bring 30,000 people to a worship party, and one guy uh, touches the piece of furniture, and he dies, verse 8 might be true. David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of that place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? Now look at 1 Chronicles chapter 15 real quickly. I'm talking about second chances. And I guarantee you this, after that, after that happened, David knew he blew it. <laughs> uh, by letting things happen that happened in that moment. Uh, 1 Chronicles 15, look if you would at verse 1. And David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched for it a tent. Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. He learned something from the last time. For them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. Look down, if you would, at verse 25. We're going to skip a little bit for sake of time. Verse 25, So David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. You know what happens? They take a couple steps. According to uh, 2 Samuel 6, they take six steps. 
And after six steps, they go, no one's dead. This is good. Let's stop here. Let's sacrifice. Amen. All right. Uh, verse 27. And David was clothed with the robe of fine linen and all the, the Levites to bear the ark and the singers. And Chenaniah, the master of the song with the singers, David also had upon him an ephod of linen. Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the cornet and with trumpets and with cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps. And it came to pass, as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looking out at a window, saw King David dancing and playing, and she despised him in her heart. Now, here's the point. David got a second chance to bring back the ark, and he did it a little bit differently than he did the first time. I want to preach to you about how to handle. It's not about if. You're, God's going to give you second chances in this life if you're saved. And if you're lost, this might be your second chance to receive him as your Savior. But the question is, how do you handle the second chance that God gives you? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother St. John, if you would. Amen. Be seated if you would. I, I was reading uh, in the Chicago Tribune about a young man named Thaddeus Jimenez. And uh, this young man, Thaddeus Jimenez, he, uh, he grew up with a single mom in, in, the, in the inner city of Chicago. Uh, inner city of Chicago is not probably where you go, man, I really want to raise my family there, you know. Uh, but on the south side, the inner city of Chicago, Thaddeus was raised a single mom, working mom. And uh, when he was a young boy, I think by the age of 13, he was already involved in gangs. Um, one of his uncles, he didn't have a dad around. There's a moral to be learned from that, by the way, gentlemen. When dads aren't around, things don't go well. Uh, but uh, he didn't have a dad, and so one of the closest male figures in his life, more like an uncle, was a guy that, that introduced him to the gang life. And so by 13 years of age, he was involved with the homicide scene and went to juvenile jail for it. But eventually, because of the significance of the case and how big of a thing it became, he was tried as an adult. And so he went to jail for X amount of years. I think it was close to about 10 years. And they realized years down the road, after he'd been in jail for so many years, and by the way, he's a little guy. And, and as a little guy, he was a guy that always got beat up by everybody in prison. And just, I mean, a rough life, rough life. And uh, he goes to, to jail. He wasn't, I mean, he was running with the wrong crowd, and he probably deserved to go to juvenile jail, but not to be tried as an adult. And, and later on, the city of Chicago comes back and says, whoops. And they give him $25 million and let him go free. You say, what is that? A second chance. Now, you know what happens? August 2015, on a muggy Monday morning, he's driving around in a lowrider with his friend, and he's got a custom uh, a silver blue-plated uh, pistol in his hand, drives up to a guy named Earl Castile and says, what's going on? And Earl says, nothing, man. What's going on with you? And he says, you tell me why I shouldn't shoot you right now. And Earl goes, man, we've known each other forever. What's your problem? Bam, bam, shoots him in his legs. Guy drops to his knees. Eventually, the cops uh, catch up to him. And uh, Thaddeus had a real brilliant friend with him that videotaped everything. So they had all the evidence right there, and he goes to jail. You know what that is? That, that's a sad way to see someone squander a second chance. And you look at that and go, man, if I was given the opportunity, I wouldn't blow $25 million away. But let me tell you what a lot of God's people are doing. They're squandering their second chance at life Amen. in Jesus Christ. You've been given a shot. Let me, let me explain what goes on in this story. David, at the first time that he moves the ark, at the end of it, there's mourning, and there's sadness, and there's doubt, and there's hopelessness, and there's dejection, and someone dies. And at the second, the second time around, there's joy, and there's singing, and it's a blessing. What's the difference? How he handled the second chance. And Christian, let me say this. Before you were saved, you know what you were? The Bible says neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. You know what he says? But now ye are sanctified, ye are washed, 
Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know what that is? That's a second chance. And you've got it if you're here and you're saved this morning. Listen, our God is the kind of God that likes to bring the dead back to life. He likes to see the lame walk again. He likes to bring sight to the blind. He likes to take something that's vile and make it clean. You know, back there in the book of Job, they say, can a clean thing come out of an unclean thing? And you know what? From the New Testament perspective, yes, it can by the grace of God. Amen. You've been given a second chance at life. And listen, you might have a second chance. Some folks have a second chance at, at doing marriage right, at raising kids right. Listen, whatever your second chance is, don't blow it. Don't squander it. People all the time say, well, this is how I was raised. Don't raise your kids the same way. You've got a second chance. Don't make the same mistakes. People say all the time, well, it's just the way I was raised, or it's how I was brought up, or this is just the, these were the cards that I were dealt. Well, listen, if those are the cards that you were dealt, deal them out differently to somebody else. You've got a second chance at life. Now, I want you to consider this. Sometimes, sometimes the problem with the first time around has to do with the people that were involved. Now, I told you earlier, I told you, I said, look, these names are important in the Bible. And you go through them and you go, well, I'm a Benedab. Who's a Benedab? What does it matter? When you go back to first, uh, don't go there now, but if you go back to 1 Samuel 16, when, when the Lord brings the prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse, the father of David, you know what Samuel does? He goes, hey, where are your boys? Let's start with the oldest, Eliab. And he works down his way. And the third guy mentioned, guess who it is? Abinadab. Guess who Ahio and Uzzah are? They are David's nephews. They had no business carrying the ark of God. It was not their place to be doing it. That belonged to the Levites. Can I say this? Sometimes you allow things in your life through the people that you allow because they're familiar to you. And you go, oh, well, their family, it's safe. It wasn't safe. Can you imagine having to go to your brother and go, hey, hey, bro, I let this happen. I knew better. I was the king. I directed this. And your son's dead. That's what David had to do. Why do you think he was so displeased that day? Sometimes it's because of the people that we have involved in the situation. Sometimes it's because the things that we're doing the first time around, we base our decisions based on convenience, not on what God says. I said this in Sunday school. Guys, you're not going to improve upon this book. This is it. When you, when you get away from this and when you go, well, it's just not convenient. I can find a better way. People talk about raising kids. Well, I don't believe in corporal punishment. Okay, then you're not a Bible believer. Amen. You say, why? Because that's what the Bible says. Listen, in Sunday school, we talked about fornication and all that, that goes along with that, and how you should stay away from it and abstain from it and flee from it and all the damage that comes from it. And people go, it's not that big of a deal. Really? Tell me that in 10 years. Tell me that in 20 years when your kids are a mess because of the decisions that you made and one night stand you thought wouldn't matter and it affects your kids for the next three generations to come. You tell me that when you look in the eyes of your Savior and he says, I gave you a chance and I gave you a way out and you didn't take it. You tell me it's not a big deal. You know what's happening this morning? God's reminding you of the fact that you have a second chance, Christian. You have a second chance to do things right. And I want to help you make sure you don't squander them. I guarantee you when David is crying over his nephew passing away and 30,000 that were dancing and singing and the music was playing, guys, you want to bring the music to a screeching halt? Talk about, I mean, they're, you know, this is my story, this is my song, praising my say. What just happened with Uzzah? <laughs> Boy, that brings the music to a screeching halt. And everything, everyone's looking, what, what's going on? What's that? 30,000 people there to watch this thing. And David has to end that day with mourning and sadness and tears coming down his face. And as he's thinking about the fact that he could have stopped it, he could have done things differently. He knew what God's word says. God's word in Exodus 25 says, you bear that ark with staves, sticks, and you overlay those staves with gold to remind you of the nature of God and his holiness and royalty. And you carry those, that ark, and it may be a burden. It may be old-fashioned to carry it that way. And it may not be the way that the Philistines do it, because when the Philistines sent back the ark, they sent it on a cart. Where did they get the idea from? It may not be the way the world does it, but it's still God's way. Amen. 
And sometimes we make the mistake the first time around of, of designing these plans in our lives based on what is convenient and not on what is right and what God says. I want to help you this morning. And I want to make sure that with your second chance, you make it different. You know, the world says luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. L luck isn't really a vocabulary word in the Christian's dictionary. You know that? It's not about luck. It's not about happenstance. You know? Uh, I tease my wife all the time because, you know, she grew up, it was all, her dad was, her dad, and to this day, he's, he's lost, pray for him, his name is Ken. Um, and, uh, but anytime something would happen, you go, oh man, bad luck. And every once in a while, she'll do that to me just because she knows it gets under my skin, you know. And, uh, but, but, but guys, listen, it's not about luck. It's about God bringing opportunities your way when you're prepared for them. Let me say this, handling your second chance the right way necessitates preparation. Look, if you would, go back to, to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 15. I want you to notice this and highlight this. Notice that it wasn't just a matter of chance. Some time had passed in David's life. Opportunity for him to reflect on the first time and to think about what had happened that day and how really he blew it. He had some time to think about it. And he goes, okay, if I were to do it differently, what would I do? You ever had that happen in life? Man, the best thing you can do is go, God... If you give me a second chance at this, how should I handle kids? Lord, how should I handle the husband? Lord, how should I handle the wife? Lord, how should I handle my church? I blew it the last time. I'm not going to blow it this time. God, help me be ready for that next opportunity. And the Bible says here in 1 Chronicles 15, look at verse 1. David made him houses in the city of David and prepared a place for the ark of God. Look at verse 3. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place, which he had prepared for it. Can I say this? You need to learn to prepare and make room for God's presence. Make room for God's presence. Listen, when that tragedy happens in 2 Samuel 6, you know what David says? How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? He leaves that day dejected going, this is never going to happen. It's always going to be away from the place God originally designed it, and it's my fault. You ever have that happen? You go, Lord, I know things aren't where they should be, and I, I'm owning it. It's me, but I don't even know how to fix it. Sometimes time has to go by for you to mature a little bit, to think about what happened, and to look back and go, I get it. Here I was rushing off with everybody all excited, and, and here we were running off, and I don't even know that I had everything ready on this side of it. You know what David did this time around? He prepared a place for the ark of God. You need to do, you need to learn to make room for the Lord to work. Look at 2 Kings chapter number 4. You need to learn to perceive what God is doing and prepare for it. Perceive and prepare. Look at 2 Kings chapter 4. I know what some of you are thinking. You mean to tell me there's valuable information in Kings and Chronicles? Yes, there is. There's a lot of good stuff in there if you take time to read it. 2 Kings chapter number 4. I'm going to talk to you about a great woman whose name you don't even know. When the world talks about great women, they may talk about Elizabeth Taylor, you know, and they still, she's dead, right? She, I think she passed away, right? Am I right about that? Anybody know? Okay. Uh, Some go, I don't know. I don't care about Elizabeth. You know, they still have the White Diamonds commercials that still play, and she's dead. You know, I mean, to the world, boy, what a great actress she was. And, and here's the thing. You know why some of you don't know if she's dead or not? You don't care. You know why you don't care? Because there's different names now. And the names that are now celebrated and they're now praised and worshipped 10 years from now, they're not going to care. And I can go through names from the 90s who were big names. Who was the last time you saw a big blockbuster with Meg Ryan in it? Why is everybody laughing? It's been a while, hasn't it? You know what happens? Eventually, things fade away. But here's a great woman, according to God, and you don't even know her name. You know what that shows you? The world doesn't need to know your name for you to be great in God's sight, ladies. Look at verse number 8. It fell on a, on a day that Elisha passed to shoot him, where was a great woman. That's God's commentary on her. You say, what made her great? Well, I think let's just keep reading. We might find out. And she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was. That's how you know he wasn't Baptist. Amen. She had to constrain him to eat bread. You know? I mean, it wasn't like, I mean, someone mentions gummy bears or dessert. I'm there, man. I'm there. All right? Look what it says here in verse 9. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is the holy man of God which passeth by us continually. What would she do? She said, I believe the Lord's bringing him our way, honey. I believe this is God's way of speaking to us. Honey, I, I think there's something to this guy coming around. Notice she doesn't go and force her husband to do anything. 
She provides an idea. Ladies, there's some good practical stuff for you to learn here. It says here in verse 10, let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. By the way, this is where we get the term prophet's chamber. It comes from this passage. I pray thee on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick, and a Keurig coffee maker. I'm sorry, that was me. I would have inserted that. <laughs> and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? He said, What happened? God brought a blessing her way because she saw what God was bringing her way more than once. And she said, Light bulb, maybe we should prepare the next time he comes around. Listen, when God brings things your way and he keeps bringing you back to it and bringing you back to it, it might be the Lord's trying to say, hey, I'm actually trying to answer a prayer for you. I'm actually trying to bless you, but there's something you've got to do to receive it. Can you imagine being the innkeeper that told Mary and Joseph you can have a stable on Judgment Day? You know, I mean, imagine that. Uh, imagine standing before this, the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, going, hey, I'm really sorry about the whole stable thing. You know, <laughs> if I had known any better, I would have put you in the, you know, the, the best suite that we had, you know. I mean, you say, what happened? They didn't have room for him. There's no room, but you can have this. You say, what happens a lot of times is we go, Lord, I don't have room. I want you to bless me, but I don't have room for you to act. I'm not going to take the time to prepare for you to bring the thing my way. So just take the leftovers. There's a stable. Enjoy that. The Lord took it, and he was glad to take it. And what a wonderful thing. He came as a savior of mankind and was humble enough to do all that. Fine, all that's good. But think about it from the innkeeper's standpoint. I guarantee you if that guy's alive years down the road, and they're talking about this Jesus character, and you go, well, where did he say that guy was born? Bethlehem. And, and what are you saying about him being born in a stable? Well, yeah, he was born in a stable uh, because there's some jerk of an innkeeper. <laughs> say he didn't have room anywhere else. Oh, man, what a jerk that guy is, you know, right? He walks away. You say, what is that? That's us, guys. That's you when you don't make room to prepare for Jesus Christ to work in your life. Over there, I'm not going to have you turn there, but in Mark chapter 5, there's a story about a little damsel who's 12 years old, and she's dead. Everyone thinks she's dead, and the Lord brings her back to life. And You know what he says? He says to them in there, uh, she's, she, uh, she's going to be all right. You know what happens? Everyone that's in that house, the house is full of people. And the Bible says the people that were in the house, they laughed him to scorn. Let me say this, guys. There are some people that might be in your life that look at what you believe and what you value and how you esteem the Word of God and how you try to live your life according to it, and they're going to look at it and go, pfft. Now listen, you're not gonna like, you, some of you may not like what I'm about to say. You know what Jesus did? He said, get him out of here. Oh, the loving Jesus would never offend anybody. He said, get him out. I'm not working while they're here. While they're laughing at me, you know what? Tell them to pound sand. I'm going to do a miracle. They're going to be left out. They're going to wish they were on the inside. And you know what you need to learn to do sometimes? You need to learn to say, you know what? Even if it's family, even if it's someone that, that I love, I love Jesus Christ more. Amen. You say, oh, what if it's family? Well, David learned a valuable lesson that day. Sometimes keeping family in the picture when they had no business to be there can hurt them as well. The Lord wasn't going to play games there in Mark chapter 5. He wanted to do a great work. Your second chance might come through your children, parents. It might come through a friendship. It might come through your marriage. It might come through your opportunity to witness to somebody. It might come through an opportunity to serve in your church. Man, I tell you what, I, I don't say this, guys, in any, this is not pastor's way to suck people in. Ah, now I got you and you can't leave, you know. This is for your own benefit. I see this all the time. The Lord's working in someone's life. They're starting to grow. These things are changing. I mean, sanctification process is going on. God is doing some great things. They're witnessing to people. And then all of a sudden, they get to a place where they have a decision to make about whether they're going to continue going in that direction or be taken astray, whether it's by something or somebody or some event in their life. And it's the most frustrating thing to watch as a pastor because I can't make you do the right thing. I learned that lesson a while ago. While I'm accountable for how I lead, I can't make. And sometimes I watch and I go, oh, no. 
Listen, uh, if, if I come to you and I tell you this isn't the right thing, you might think it's self-serving for me to say, look, stay where God wants you to be. Don't be so quickly uh, uh, moved and don't be so quickly distracted. I, 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 was, I don't know if I, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago or not, but I was at a, a preacher's conference in Missoula, Montana. I heard a, a pastor named T- Tim Shanks, I think it is, good preacher in, in Corona, California. And uh, he's from the north woods of Idaho. I mean, he's a hunter, he's a fisher, and God has him in Corona, you know? It's really funny. Uh, and I know a preacher in northern Idaho who I look at and I go, you belong in California, dude. You don't belong here, you know? It's just funny how God puts people where he puts them. But uh, anyways, this preacher was tell, telling us, and he's illustrating about the fact that sometimes God gives second chances, and he says, look, I had this guy in my church, and I was burdened because I, I felt the Lord was wanting us to start a Spanish ministry, and I knew it was the case. And I went to this brother who was bilingual, who, who had the gifts and the abilities to, to carry this ministry on. And I went to him and I said, hey, brother, uh, Lord, lay this on my heart. I think you're the guy for it. And he says, well, let me pray about it. He says, okay, well, okay, but don't pray too long. He says, I've got to figure this out because the Lord's told me to do it and do it soon. And he goes to that brother and that brother says, you know, about a month goes by. He goes, brother, what do you think? He goes, I, 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 I don't know. I don't think so. He says, okay. He goes to another brother. He says, brother, uh, about a month or about uh, two weeks later, another guy comes, gets involved in their church, is on fire for God. And he goes to that guy, he goes, hey, brother, uh, Lord's laid this on my heart. What do you think? He goes, you got it. And that guy takes that ministry on, and it's growing, and it's thriving. And the other guy that was first asked, he's on the sidelines. He goes, hey, can I help? And he starts helping. But just sour grapes because he realizes, I should have been doing this. Six months or so goes by. And the pastor, Brother Shanks, notices this guy's just sort of like, he's there, but he's not there. And he goes to him, he goes, hey, brother, he's like, what's going on? And he starts crying, he goes, I should have taken that ministry. I blew it. I was afraid of the commitment, and I didn't want to fail, and I just, I didn't do it. It's wrong. He goes, well, I'm glad you mentioned that. He goes, I got these third and fourth grade boys. You know, I mean, who, no one goes to Bible college and goes, I can't wait to teach third and fourth grade boys. <laughs> and someday when I'm there and I'm preaching and the crowds are gathered, it's all going to be third and fourth grade boys. <laughs> it's not what people dream of. But you know what? He, he goes to him. He goes, hey, I really could use help with this. There's an opening coming up. And the bird goes, I think I'm going to take it. And he's happily serving in that church right now. You say, what do you do? He learned from his first time around. So what do you have to do? He had to make some room in his schedule. You making room for the Lord to work? Let me give you this secondly. Look, if you would, at uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and notice something else. 1 Chronicles chapter 15. I spent some time talking in Sunday school, teaching on the subject of sanctification. And I don't know that it's a, a very... Uh, it's a subject that preachers may want to stay away from at times because it requires some responsibility on the part of the hearer to do something with it and to abstain from certain things. And, and to a lot of people, that sounds like, here's what I've learned. Anytime you say, you shouldn't do this, because the Bible says so, they go, legalist. And I go, well, do you let your kids smoke drugs? Well, no. Legalist. <laughs> well, what, 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 what is the difference? Well, you drew a line, where, 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 right? You drew your own line. Okay, wonderful. Well, the Bible has them as well. And look, there's this, there's this thing called sanctification, and it means in layman's terms, you get cleaned up so God can use you. Look at verse 12. When David, look, you, I can, guys, I'm telling you, I can see this happening. David's looking back at the first time around, and it's a big party. And everybody's excited, and they're all emotional, but no one really knows what they're doing. There's no leadership, there's no direction, there's no hearkening to the words of God. And David says this time around, guys... Before you get near that thing, you better get cleaned up, boys. You want God to work in your life? Get cleaned up. Look what he says in verse 12. You're the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren. You get clean and you make sure those around you are cleaned up. So you can handle what God brings your way. Listen, let me tell you something. If you're here and you're lost, you'll never get cleaned up by your own goodness. You'll never make it, guys. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says Jesus said he might sanctify the people with his own blood. 
You are sanctified this morning through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you better thank God for that. John Newton said, the guy that wrote Amazing Grace, I'm not what I might be. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I wish to be. Ever feel like that? No, I'm not what I hope to be. But I thank God I am not what I once was. And I can say with the great apostle, by the grace of God, I am what I am. The law of God is like a mirror, Donald Barnhouse wrote. You look at a mirror, and that mirror shows you how dirty you are. You don't grab the mirror off the wall and start cleaning your face with the mirror. The mirror shows you you need to get washed up. The mirror shows you you need to get washed up. You're sanctified through the blood of Jesus, but you're sanctified through his words as well. You know what Jesus says? Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You want to get cleaned up, Christian? Get in the Bible. Let the Bible get in you. Make your decisions by what God says. Not by what the pastor says or what the church says. What does God say? And you let the Bible clean you up from the inside out. If you were to go and look at the tabernacle when they were building that thing, it's an amazing thing. Um, By the way, I, I tell you, one of the greatest family vacations you might ever take is to go to, I think it's Kentucky, Ohio area, and go see that ark encounter. That's pretty neat stuff. They're looking at building a Tower of Babel. You know, I'd like to see them make a a tabernacle type thing. I think that'd be pretty cool. But if you were to see the tabernacle, before you get into the Holy of Holies, where the glory of God comes down, before you go into where the ark is, before you get anywhere near that, there's two things you find in the outer court. You find a brazen altar, reminds you of God's judgment on sin. And after that, you find a brazen laver where the spigots of water would flow out with these flowers and the water would come out of it. And those priests were told to wash their hands and wash their feet lest they die. When someone went in to meet with God, they were cleaned up. Listen, you want God to work in your life? You want that second chance to work out? You may have to have the Lord clean some things up. I read a story about a guy that bought a property and. He was talking to likening the fact that when you get saved, you know, there's these big things that are just obvious, you know. And the Lord says that needs to go and that needs to go and that needs to go and let's bring this in. And this guy named Gordon McDonald, him and his wife bought this farm property in New Hampshire and they wanted to build a homestead out there. But before they could do that, if you know anything about New England, lots of rocks, lots of rocky ground. The fact that we had pilgrims that came here and survived is a miracle, guys. Seriously. And lots of rocky ground. And he said, you know, you clear out the boulders, and those are easy. Those are easy to see, easy to identify. Clear them out. And he says, then before you know it, he says, you think you're getting to the end, and then there's all these little rocks everywhere. And before we could ever plant any grass seed and just start to see that there was some kind of topography to the land, there's some kind of shape to the land itself, we had to go and get all the little rocks out of the way. That's sanctification. There's the things that are on the surface that everybody sees that are evident that God says those have to go. These these things need to change. But there's some things under the surface. There's these little things. If you want the seed to take hold and to take root, you've got to learn to say, Lord, I want you to clean all of me. First Chronicles 15, look if you would at verse 13. Handling your second chance necessitates sanctification. Let me say this. It necessitates some order. It necessitates some order. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, you know, if you're type A, like I am, (laughs) then you just naturally gravitate to order. You know, you walk in the closet, the shirts are here, button up here, colors are coated by this. Some of you are going, you're weird, man. I know, I know. And, and you know the tie rack, the spinning tie rack is over here, you know. And then here's the coats, here's the suit coats, here's the jackets, here's the sports coats. And it's just, oh, all right, you go, well, that's easy because you're type A. Let me say this. It's not about being type A, B, C, or Z, all right. It's about being a Bible-believing Christian. Not about your closet, okay, <laughs> but about what we're about to talk about. Look at verse 13. For because you did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us, for that we sought him not after the due order. Can I say this? Were they not wanting to do a good thing with bringing back the ark? Wasn't it a good thing? Did they do it in the right order? Can I say this? Sometimes, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing, right? She's attractive. Good. 
She's smart, wonderful. She laughs at my jokes, great. Is she saved? Well, we're working on that. Does she believe the same things you do? Well, out of order, don't you think? I mean, I, I want my kids to get the best education. I want them to, to, to be successful, and I want them to, to learn character. I want them to learn, oh, okay, wonderful. Do they, do they know the Bible? Do they know God better than you do? How do you expect them to survive in the next generation? The world's not becoming easier for Christians. It's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. They need more of God. What am I saying? These other things are good, but they're out of order in Christians' lives. The Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order. You know how they did it the first time? How they felt like it. You know, if you look back at the first time around in some of the situations in your life, you know what you did? You did it like you felt like it. And you, some of you, and I mean, this, I mean this lovingly, some of you have been paying for that for years. See, I need to do it God's way, in order. Go to Matthew 22. I want you to think about this. Matthew 22. The day that my daughter comes home and says, Daddy, I met a man and we're getting married. First off is to make, ch -ch -ch, I'm going to go see this boy. <laughs> Step number one, all right? There was a, a young man that seems to take interest in my daughter, so he knew the right thing. He sent me shotgun shells for Christmas. <laughs> I thought, and then he asked me, he asked me the other day, you ever used all those? I said, not all of them, buddy. <laughs> uh, it's hard to be my daughter, you know, it really is. Matthew 22, look if you would at uh, verse number 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the... None of that tells you there's an order to this. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You know why the world is a mess? They think they can do the second and treat it like the first and everything turns out okay. You treat the second like the first and you end up with a dictator that runs the world and the great tribulation happens. Amen. Amen. That's what's going to happen. You say, why? Because all you need is love. Love, love. All we need is love, right? Just, just love your, your neighbor and, and take care. And it's humanism is all it is. You say, what's the big deal of getting them mixed up? It's a real big problem. Can I say this? For some of God's people, they'll think nothing of serving their family and doing these things for people. But if God asks them to change something, or God asks them to change their schedule, or God says, look, you're growing, you're learning, but I want you to make it and, and learn a little bit more Bible. Get here on a Wednesday night or get here for Sunday school or whatever. I, no, Lord, I don't think so. You say, why? Because things are out of order. That's why. She says, Daddy, I've met a guy. Sorry, kid, you're the illustration. You know what I'm going to say? She may say he's wonderful and he's smart and he's loving and he's funny and he's gentle and... He's really affectionate, and I really like him. If she says affection, I'll say, tell me how you know this. <laughs> Poor kids. She's like, I hate you, Dad. <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask her, though? Does he know God? Does he love God? Does he believe that book like you do? Amen. Oh, we'll figure that stuff out later. You may never figure it out. Let me tell you something. There's many a man and a woman that figured, that we'll figure that stuff out later. I'm going through this book. Sorry, guys, all this marriage stuff is in my mind. You can blame Jose and Dini, okay? <laughs> getting, getting ready for them to get married. I've been studying about marriage and trying to help them out, just point me in the right direction, which, by the way, is a blessing. It's nice to have someone who goes, we have no problems. Amen? <laughs> but we want to know so we don't make the problems, right? And I'm going through this book, and I'm reading all this stuff. I'm going, man, this is good. And what I realize is so many times what people do is they enter into marriage with this Romantic idea of love being an emotional thing. Does love have emotions? Yes. Is love in and of itself, by itself, true biblical love, an emotion? Eh. You say, why? Because the infatuation, the attraction, the things that are there. Here's how the dating scene works. I like this person. They make me feel good. We enjoy ourselves. When the feelings fade away, I date somebody else. 
And obviously they were the problem, not me. And I do that until which time I find someone who puts a ring on the finger before we get to that fading of emotion level. But then eventually, a year or so down the road, the emotions fade again, right? And so everybody thinks, well, I married the wrong person. No, not necessarily. The issue is you don't understand what love is. And you put things out of order. And because you put them out of order, you're trying to play catch up now five years down the road with kids. And it's hard, isn't it? It is. Here's all I'm saying, guys. If you want to handle your second chance the right way, it needs to be done in God's fashion, in His order. Handling your second chance the right way means a burden has to be borne. Go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 15. You know what I'd like to tell you? I'd like to tell you you get saved and all your problems go away. Wouldn't that be nice? I'd like to, I, I, I would like to write a book called Other Pipe Dreams That Christians Have. <laughs> that would be one of them. You know, I get saved and all my problems go away. I get right with the Lord. I, I want God to work in my life, and everything's just smooth sailing from here on out. It's not how it's even designed to be, guys. It's not designed to be that way. Look, look at uh, 1 Samuel 15. Look, if you would, at verse 15. And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God ugh, upon their shoulders. Man, my wife says, you know, hey, honey, I think we should try this workout thing. And me being the macho, oh, pfft, yeah, sure, some video you want me to try? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. And the guy's like, you know, and do this and, and, do, and squats. And, oh, there's no weights if I'm going up my legs. I can't move them. You say, what is that? You don't increase strength by adding no burden. You know how you get stronger? Adding a burden. And the amazing thing about those workouts is you don't even have to grab a weight. There's enough burden on your body already. You just have to move in the right way. Listen, there's enough burden in life. God just has to move things the right way to get you to see that. And I want you to notice that what they did the first time, they looked at it and they go, there's got to be a more ergonomic way to carry this thing. There's got to be an easier way. And God's looking at it going, boys, you don't want to try that. And they're designing this thing. They go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember when the Philistines sent back the ark? They did it the easy way. We can do that too. It'll work out really well for us. Listen, they did it. They're okay. Do you really want to measure yourself by the world, by the way? And so anyways, they're going to go, oh, let's design this cart. And they put up the drawings together. They go, look, look, we've got a new cart. Look, at isn't it awesome? Yeah, cart version 1.1. It was also the last one that they designed, amen? And you say, what did God say? Hey, boys, you want to do it the right way? You've got to bear a burden. And I wish I could tell you that there's no burden to bear, but I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 11. Reading a book called uh, God's Smuggler. You guys ever heard of that book? A guy named uh, Brother Andrew who was uh, Dutch, raised Dutch during uh, Nazi occupation of World War II and eventually goes, and, uh, goes behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, you have to understand, historically, nobody understood what was happening when the Iron Curtain was being established. No one really knew what the communists were about. They had speculations, they had thoughts, but it was not completely known to the outside world. And this guy goes behind the Iron Curtain and smuggles Bibles and literature and gospel tracts, and God uses him in an amazing way. You know what happened before he ever got there? He went to a Bible school where you had to work, and, and, and you had to, they, they sent him out on a mission. They, the, uh, the, Mr. Dinan was the leader of this thing, and he goes, all right, Andy, you're really going to like this. He goes, okay, let's go. Here's your first mission. Where am I going? You're going to go on a month-long tour of Scotland, because it's there in England. And he goes, okay, right, wonderful. I'll go do a, a month-long tour in Scotland. Where do I get the money? Um, I'm going to give you a one-pound banknote. That's it. Okay, no problem. Well, here's the deal, Andy. Before you, under, before you go out and you understand, you have to pay for all the refreshments for people that come. You've got to pay for the rentals of the dining halls that you rent. You've got to pay for advertising. And he goes, I do all that off of one pound? Yep. Well, I guess we'll be passing around the collection plate quite a bit, won't we? Oh, no, that's the other part of the rule. You can't ask for money. That's a burden. And you know what happened? He said that him and his team never went without. And when they got back, they came back with more than they had when they started. And you know what made him the great man that he was? Going through stuff like that. What is that? That's a burden that God designed for you to carry. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Matthew 11, look at verse number 28. Come unto me, 
All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that a blessing? Now I want you to think about this, though. Look what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. A yoke is something you put on oxen, and there's this, this curve to it. There's a, a connecting piece. And, you know, here I am, great farmer, you know. And uh, I don't know a whole lot about this, but I understand how these things are built. And here's what I can tell you about a yoke. If the ox on this side is going in that direction, guess what the other ox has to do? He doesn't have a whole lot of choice. That's why he says to take his yoke upon you. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is non-existent. Is that what it says? It says my burden is what? Oh, Lord, it's hard. Yeah, well, it's harder living life without the Spirit of God. It's harder facing these things as a lost person. Yeah, it's a burden. Yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, life is hard sometimes. But man, the burden that you're bearing when you're doing things God's way is so much better. You sleep better at night knowing you're doing it God's way. You don't have to look back and go, man, I I wonder how this is going to turn out. You're doing it God's way. It'll turn out right. Paul had a good life before he was saved. You know that? You know what he was? He was a murderer. And he was lost. And after he got saved and, and the Lord washed him in the precious blood of Jesus Christ, you know what he writes about his life? In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness. It's almost like if you want to have a good time, stay away from Paul. <laughs> you know what he's saying? Listen, I was lost, I'm, I'm saved now, but life is still perilous. But if you're going to face them, you might as well face them knowing you're doing it God's way. Go back to 1, Samuel, or 1 Chronicles chapter 15. There are times when... I look at situations in life and I go, man, why does it have to be like this? We all face that. Why does it have to be like this? Why does the burden have to feel like this? But every single time, the Lord reminds me, son, this is how you got stronger last time. Christian, can I tell you, this is how you're going to get stronger this time. First Chronicles 15, look at verse 26. Handling your second chance the right way means you learn to accept God's help. Look, if you would, at verse 26 in our passage. It came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Do you know what happens when you accept someone's help? You know why some of you don't like to take people's help? You know what it means? It means you can't do it all on your own. And listen, I I know, I know there's some people that take help all too willingly, and then there's some that don't take it at all. You need to learn to accept help sometimes. You need to do that. You say, why? Because sometimes that's God's way of ministering to you through somebody else. But you know what happens when you accept someone else's help? That means you are accepting, you are acknowledging that you can't do it all on on your own. You might be accepting that someone else's way is better than your way. You know what happens in any of these circumstances? You have to learn to let go of your pride. You know what happened with these Levites? They, they go, man, we remember how this happened the first time. This time's different. Well, you know what we did? We were opening it to God's word. And we did it God's way. And we bore the burden the way he designed us to, be, to bear it. And then we realized about six steps into the thing, God, you're helping us. You know what God wants to do? He wants to help you in your second chance. You need to learn to let him do it. The Bible says of, of the Lord Jesus Christ in Hebrews 2, he's able to secure them. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 5, Let your conversation be without covetous, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. That's God's desire for you, Christian. Go to the end of the chapter, look at verse 28. Handling your second chance the right way leads to joy. Look at verse 28. You say, what's going on? A good time. (laughs) The first time David was displeased with the Lord. This time, boy, there's joy. And you know what happens according to 2 Samuel 6? 
There's so much fellowship. David is passing out food and drink, and everyone's just having a feast together, and they're enjoying the fact that they went six steps. Not that the ark came all the way home. They stopped and had a feast when they went six steps forward. You know, sometimes you as a Christian, you don't think that the progress that God has made in your life is a big deal. Sometimes you need to stop and just praise Him for where you're at. And say, Lord, thank you for your help. And Lord, in that, Lord, I want to be joyful. You know what joy is? Joy is the byproduct of obedience. Now let me say this lastly. Look at verse 29. You need to come to grips with this. Not everybody is going to be excited and as excited as you are about your second chance. There are going to be some people that look at what you did and how joyful you are in it and how God worked it, and they're going to go, well, it works for him, but it won't for anybody else. Or they'll look at you and go, do you have to be that fanatical and that excited about God? You know what Michael did? She despised David in her heart. What did David do? David was making a fool of himself, rejoicing in what God had done. He was excited. You say, why? Because he remembered the last time. <laughs> And this time around, it was different. Man, I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm thankful for my parents, and I love them. But I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I, I determined something with my wife when we got married. We said, you know what, we didn't have all the knowledge that we have now. And our parents, we don't blame them. Our parents didn't have all the knowledge that we have now. You know what we said? We're going to do it different. And man, there's some smiles and there's some joy looking at where things had been in our childhood and where things are for our kids now. It's like night and day. There's some joy in that. Joy is the byproduct of obedience. But I'll tell you, when you're happy and when you're joyful in the midst of that, you have to keep in mind the Pharisees weren't happy about the lame that walked again. The Pharisees weren't happy about the blind that would see. They weren't happy about the woman that was forgiven of her sin of adultery, and they definitely weren't happy in shouting Hosanna with everybody else when Jesus came into Jerusalem. What am I getting at? Not everybody is going to be interested. Not everybody that's in your life right now wants to see you become a fanatic for Jesus Christ with your second chance. But you should anyways. I'm going to close with this. In 1929, there in the Rose Bowl... Georgia Tech played the University of California. And there was a muffed play where Georgia Tech fumbled the ball, and a guy named Roy Rigels picked up the ball and ran 65 yards in the wrong direction <laughs> and was about to score a touchdown for Georgia Tech. One of his teammates, thankfully, caught up to him, tackled him. And when he looked up and he saw everybody infuriated, he realized what he did. And he goes in that, it's halftime, they go into the locker room and He's dejected. He's got, if you've ever competed in sports and you've given it all you've got, or you've ever done that with anything in your life, and you poured everything into it, and it doesn't turn out the way, not only does it not turn out right, you're the one that messed everything up. You know, I mean, it does something to you. And he's sitting in that locker room. He's got his towel on his head, and he's just sobbing. And normally, coach is going to have time. We're going to do this. We're going to do Quiet. Coach Nibs didn't say a word. Right before two minutes, before they go out, here's what he said. The team that started the first half will start the second. And they quietly trickled out of that locker room except for Roy. And he said, hey, son, did you hear what I said? The team that started the first half is going to start the second half. And with tears coming down his face, he said, coach, I can't do it to save my life. I've ruined you. I've ruined the University of California. No, the liberals did that in the 60s. Amen. <laughs> I've ruined myself, and I could never face that crowd in that stadium to save my life. You know what the coach said? Roy, get up and get out there. The game is only half over. Christian, are you here? Are you saved? You know, wherever you're at, you know what you are? You're, you might be a dog, but you're a living dog, and you're better than a dead lion. You've got a second chance. Make it right. Let's all stand up.